Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I am delighted to welcome Professor Steve Taylor to our Society Hub podcast series here at the uh, School for Business and Society at the University of York in England. And today, Professor Taylor is speaking to us today about leadership as craft. Uh, just a little uh, biopic about Professor Taylor. Professor Taylor is from Worcester Polytechnic Institute Business School in Massachusetts in the United States of America. Professor Taylor's research is focused in two areas. Firstly, organizational aesthetics take seriously the idea that management is much an art as it is a science and applies art-based scholarship and practice to management and organizations. Secondly, Professor Taylor's work focuses upon reflective practice, that is the ability to analyze one's own actions and learn from that how to be more effective, ethical, and artful as managers and leaders. As well as Steve's work as an acclaimed researcher and teacher, he is also a playwright whose plays have been performed across the world in England, France, Poland, as well as Canada, New Zealand, Italy, and the United States of America. From Professor Taylor's work in theatre, he has come to realise that learning is a whole body sport, and this belief informs both his research and his teaching. Professor Taylor, it is great to have you with us at the School for Business and Society here at the University of York in England. Good day to you. Good day. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, so if we were to start, um, Professor Taylor, um, the purpose of the Society Hub podcast series is to give those outside of the University of York an opportunity to speak to both the university as an institution, but also uh, to the School for Business and Society about the challenges which podcast contributors, you yourself today, consider that we should be focusing upon in the future. So for us, this series is not about us setting the agenda, it's very much um, about you as a contributor setting the agenda. Um, today, you've chosen to speak to us about leadership as craft and the influence of art and creativity within leadership. Can you tell our listeners and viewers a little bit more about the craft approach to leadership, please? Sure. That, um, when I first started studying leadership as a serious academic, one of the things I noticed was the number of times the phrase, the art of leadership gets used. And, and I wondered what that meant, particularly as someone coming from with a background with a master's in theater and a bachelor's in creative writing. I like the art of leadership. Okay. What does that mean? And I, I said, look, and nobody ever talked about what they actually meant by that. And, and what I, that I came to understand was that um, what people really meant by the art of leadership was it wasn't a science. And I thought, oh, okay, it's not a science, which led me to question of what is a science? And, and there's a way in which in management, we have tried to really make it a science as much as possible. We've tried to quantify and analyze and be able to rigorously solve problems in an exact and singular way. And, and when we say science, I think that's what we mean. It turns out the actual practice of science is actually much more of an art than a science. Any, but be with me that as it may, there is this idea of science as something where I can analytically figure out how to do the best thing, how to do what the right answer is, what the optimal answer is. And what people were saying when they were saying that leadership is an art, they just meant, well, it isn't that. You, you can't do that with leadership. And, and I buy that. But as someone with a training in art, I I, uh, I, I, suppose I wanted to take the question more seriously. What does it mean for leadership to be an art? And in my, my first book, which I came out in 2012, Leadership Craft, Leadership Art, I really took on this idea of what would leadership look like from the perspective of an artist? If it really was a creative practice and an art, what would that mean? And, and that's what I spend the whole book exploring. And kind of the punchline, the, the final answer on it is, well, if it's really an art, you should focus on the craft because that's how you get good art. That's how you get better at art. And you talk to artists, it's all about the craft. And, and to me, this was kind of, it was like, well, yeah, as a, as a playwright, I work on my craft. Um, but it's not something of how people generally talk about leadership or management in it in any way. And I think it's, um, you know, it's like, whoa, here's the big hidden secret, which I'm happy yeah. to share with the world because I think, there are many ways in which approaching leadership as a craft would greatly improve the quality of leadership we see in the world. 
it's really fascinating to hear you speak about it. And it, uh, it strikes me as though it's not just interdisciplinarity, it's really a whole rethinking of what we've previously understood about leadership. Uh, and really what's also interesting is about your focus on art as alongside um, craft. And that leads me nicely to the next area that I wanted to speak to you about, Professor Taylor. Your work involves not just a focus on leadership as craft, but also the use of art, but also performance and creativity. These are not often uh, forms associated with leadership. Can you say a little bit more about why you consider it important to fuse art, creativity and leadership? Yeah, well, I think art is something we associate with the creativity and arts is a good way to make us more creative. The question then is, why is creativity important for leadership? And it depends on what is what exactly is leadership? You know, this is another question that if you scan the literature and you read 100 different articles and books to define leadership, you'll get 100 different definitions of what leadership is. And I tend to see leadership as um, in this kind of broad way as it's kind of like based on Newtonian dynamic, Newtonian physics, in the sense that an organization at rest will tend to stay at rest unless acted upon by leadership. You know, an, an organization in motion will tend to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force, which is leadership. And leadership Indeed. is that thing which brings about change. So in that sense, I think it always requires creativity. Is like, how am I going to change? How is that going to happen? Because changing organizations, organizations are complex, emergent things that are difficult to analytically understand and predict in any sort of linear way that we're used to thinking of. You know, we, we generally don't have any intuitive analytic sense of how these things function, nor even a very good non-intuitive sense. The, uh, the mathematics of organizations is, you know, is something many people maybe aspire to, but clearly isn't there. So it's, it's much more like an art. It's much more about creativity. Thus, I think it's it's critical aspect of what leadership is. I think if you're not involved in being, if you're running an organization and you're not embracing creativity and being creative, you're probably not really leading. You're probably just managing. I say just managing. I, I have great respect for managing. I think managing is hard, but I think it's a different thing than leadership. Yeah, it's it, it, it's really interesting. You mentioned uh, a key word there, critical, um, which is, I think, really important. And that leads me to ask you, is leadership craft something which you believe someone is born with or can it be learned or taught? Well, I definitely think like, I think all crafts can be learned. And, and of course, some of us have more natural skill than others. You know, some of us are going to be naturally good at it, but we can all learn it and we can get fairly good at it with practice. You know, I, I spent, like I said, many years, I think I told you this before, but I spent many years playing trombone from like age 10 to age 20. And I got pretty good at it as a craftsman based purely on craft without, I would say, and I think anyone who's heard me play trombone would agree that not a lot of natural skill, not a lot of natural talent, just craft and just practice. And, and I think, and I got good enough. I got good enough to be a, a competent, I got good enough to be a, a pretty darn good third chair trombone player in a jazz band. But, you know, and the world needs third chair trombone players. Let's be clear, you know, there's not a lot of glory in being a third chair trombone player, but the world needs them. And, and I think, you know, the world needs a whole lot more leaders who are third chair trombone player quality leaders. That, and I think almost anybody can learn that, that level of craft if they put their mind to it and they work on it and they approach it as a craft. Yeah, it, it, it's great. And it, it links um, to something that when I was speaking to your biopic earlier that you see this work as an all body sport, particularly in terms of the art. And that speaks and that echo is coming through again in terms of that persistence, even that you, from your own experience as that trombone player uh, at an early age, persistence, practice, keeping at it, that this is something that can be distinguished from management if you keep at it and if you're prepared to make that commitment. Yeah, I think it is. And I think, you know, the, the difference with management, again, management's hard, but management is about all those day-to-day -day keeping things going. And in, fact, in some sense, it's the opposite. It, it's, it's you fight inertia, but you're basically, let's keep doing what we're doing and doing it well and doing it more efficiently and more effectively. But let's, but it's, you know, it's worrying about like the little small budget problems we run into. You know, it's worrying about the, the little interpersonal 
issues that happen regularly. It, it's all the little little things that you have to. It's solving the problem of you know as a as an academic leader, I, I managed to spawn you know give away most of the management duties that you know like to our department said somebody and our director of program said you got to figure out what the course schedule looks like and who's going to teach it next year you, you know how many what courses you have to offer when you have to offer them you kind of know who the group of teachers potential teachers are you got to solve that problem put that together in a way that works for everybody because you know like oh and it would be ideal if leadership was taught on tuesday evenings but it turns out the person we want to teach leadership isn't available on tuesday evenings because mm -hmm. they have other commitments so we you know all that stuff that's management it's hard it's problem solving but it's it's not to me leadership in the sense of the the big like what are we doing and how do we move to a different place great no fascinating professor um, and i know you mentioned we were, were chatting before just as the prelude um uh, to our podcast today um and one of the key points that you made then uh, is that often we don't hear leaders themselves speaking more widely in society about craft, about their approach as an art form. Why do you think that is? Yeah, there's, there isn't a tradition of that. I mean, I mean, realistically, the tradition of leadership in organizations doesn't go back a really long way, you know, no more than 100, 150 years at most of people actually think, you know, leaders are important and we need to, leaders of organizations in particular, leaders of countries and leaders of, of uh, religions and stuff were obviously very important. But leaders of businesses weren't because they're mostly just the people who own it and businesses weren't that big, but they've become more bigger and managers have played a bigger role. And, and part of, and in doing so, there's been this sort of glorification of leadership, the heroic leaders, like it's the leader doing all these amazing mm. things. And craftspeople just don't do that. They don't, even if they produce amazing things, they don't talk about it that way. So the dominant narratives have been pushed in a direction that is almost antithetical to craft. And it's, and it's um, you know, and so it just hasn't been part of the deal and it hasn't been part of the tradition. And it's, it's fascinating to me. I remember, I think I first started really hearing people talk about craft maybe in the 60s, 70s. Like the 60s particular, I was young, but you'd hear actors talk about their craft, mm. and commitment to their craft. And this idea as I went off in the, the high school and college that actors would take, experienced actors would take master classes from other actors. And when they weren't doing something, they, they would work on their craft. And this is, you know, that there's something really noble and wonderful about that. And at the same time, we had this, started to have the rise of what I would call sort of almost the fetishization of craft. We had books like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and later Shop Classes, <laughs> Old Craft, which are really about like craft is this mystical, wonderful thing giving purpose to life. And, and I don't think they're wrong. I think they it's maybe a bit overblown, but there's something powerful about that. And, and interesting, it wasn't until much later, maybe the 80s, maybe the 90s even, when I started to hear that course kind of discussion of working on my craft as slipping out into other parts of society and particularly into professional athletics. They started talk, listening to like American football players, started talking about what are you doing in the off season? Said, I'm going to work on my craft. What does that mean? I'm going to work on how I catch the ball, how I run, how I do these little things. I'm going to get better at my craft. So when it comes time to actually compete, I'll be better at it. And, and the idea of thinking of athletic endeavor as craft is, is really interesting and fairly new. But I've never been with leaders of organizations that, who, talk, who sit around and talk about their craft in the way that when you're with a bunch of musicians, you get a bunch of drummers together, they'll talk about symbols for like an hour. <laughs> it's, you know, this Absolutely. Is, it's that crafty thing. This is what craft people do. You get a bunch of painters together and they're talking about different brands of paint and different types <laughs> of how you prepare them and, you know, do them preparing the canvas, all the, you know, these crafty, technique-y, detail -y stuff. And, and um, you know, and almost without fail, this is what crafts people do when they get together. And talk with and, other people. And you just don't see that in organizational leaders. Absolutely. And, it, and it's wonderful to hear that that's an approach in your expertise that you're seeking to nurture. Because what I hear coming through is when you mention that in other art forms, people learn from master classes, males, females. But there's also coming through on what you're saying that as well as learning from others who have gone before or seem to have expertise, there's also by trying to perf perfect and your own individual trait and approach 
that style, recognizing there's a nuance to that. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to me, that's a big part of craftsmanship. It's whether I go, if I'm, you know, working, if I'm a woodworker, I spend time working on how do I do this and get better at it. And you hear woodworkers talk about, well, I spent the first five years making boxes, you know, because I get better. And I learned a lot of little things. I learned about joinery. It was a fairly easy way to learn about joinery and technique. And I learned how to do marquetry inlay. And I learned, I started, and I tried, and the, you know, the first times weren't very good, but I got better at it. And that that sense of like, I'm going to pursue this because it's there's something inherently interesting about the practice mm. of the craft and getting better at it. It's a craft, you know. I think that's partly how you know this is the craft for you is you are inherently interested in how do I do this and how do I get better at it. L listening to you as well, speak, uh, Steve. There's also uh, coming through a, a sense of really rethinking and reshaping this discipline as well, and and so from. Working with organizations, what do you consider the challenges for institutions such as the University of York and the School for Business and Society or other organizations more widely in adopting leadership as craft? Well, well the big challenge, I will, I will draw a parallel here. I would say leadership is much at the moment place where, say, acting was in the West around 1900. And that is... So this was a place where their acting had been going on, theater had been going on for thousands of years. There was some incredibly great performances that happened. And there were some incredibly not great performances, a mm. lot. And along came Konstantin Stanislavski in Russia. And Stanislavski- A favorite of mine. <laughs> well, he came along and he, he identified, a, he was concerned, with, if you read An Actor Prepares, which I think anybody who's interested in leadership read An Actor Prepares. It's one of the great have books to, have to, of all yeah. time. And I think one of the great leadership books of all time. I so agree it's, with you. It, it is. He, he had, you know, he said his problem was that he had actors who would have the inspired, have these inspired performances one night. And people love it. And the next night they wouldn't. And they didn't know how to become, be inspired each night. They didn't have conscious control over what they're doing. They didn't weren't masters of their craft. They were sort of subjects to their craft. And what he figured out was how to do it. He figured out that if you focus on objectives, intentions, verbs, you can actually reproduce human behavior in a way that that is believable and works on stage night after night. You know, he figured out Absolutely. how to do it. And what that and I think in leadership we have not gotten anyone who's figured out how to do it in the way that Stanislavski figured out how to do acting. And, yeah. and since that Stanislavski's time, there's been lots of great acting coaches who've added to, who've built on that in various ways, who've integrated it with, you know, you bring in like the interesting stuff in Europe, the Grotowski, you bring in the, the, the Suzuki in Japan, the, the, whole, the, the whole method stuff in the US and Strasbourg and all those people. Uh, it, it, it's, um, you know, they, they've advanced on it, but it was all from that base of that initial, like, here's the base of how we do this. And then we can build off into different schools and different directions. But there's a, we don't have that base in leadership. We don't understand leadership well enough to actually be able to tell people, this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. That's that's the big challenge. And I think that that will, I don't know, maybe we're just waiting for our stand, the Stanislavski of leadership. And, and I say, because, you know, because leadership's been happening for thousands of years. And sometimes it's inspired and works and sometimes it isn't. And the same person okay. might work completely amazing for one person. The next time they try it, slightly different context, they could fall completely flat on their face. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, absolutely. And I know here at uh, the School for Business and Society and here at University of York and our whole ethos of an institution is for public good, uh, that uh, I, I really believe that we're open at this time uh, to listen and to adjust and really rethink and, and push boundaries. So it's, again, wonderful to hear you speak in, in, in this way. And I know it'd be tremendously helpful to many who are listening. And, and I think, you know, when we say for public good, I, I've written about, I wrote an article with uh, Matt Statler and Donald Ladkin about the ethics of crap of the, eth the ethical implications of a craft of leadership. And I think they're, they're huge. I think craft in inherently encompasses a care, mm. a care for others, a care for what you're doing. That is um, a care for the process, a care for the resources that, that uh, inherently ethic brings in a, a care ethic that I think has got to be that we need for leadership. Absolutely. You know, 
it kind of goes back to the classic, you know, what used to be when I was first learning leadership, they always talked about the classic question, the Hitler question, was Hitler a good leader? And okay, mm -hmm. people go, no, because he did horrible things. It's like, well, but he's pretty effective at it. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and I think producing and, you know, bringing it in as a craft, bringing in some of that the ethical and, and uh, normative considerations much more makes it very central and very just part of what it is to be a leader. It, it, it's an interesting point is, uh, that you make just there and the examples that you use as to what are leaders, who are leaders, how do we define that, uh, and many differences uh, uh, across those, those examples. But what's also really interesting about what you said in terms of contemporary speaker, the ethical approaches, the care of people in today's society. And I, I'm reminded of just where we've all come globally in organisations, particularly in the wake of the pandemic where so every institution individuals throwing into the unknown and um, having to rethink how to do business in a in, in a socially distant world or online as well and that really forced us to think that we can work in an ethos of care uh, and do things differently but also do them quickly when we're required to do it uh, as well so it's an interesting point um, considering, Steve, that you're impressed of research and, and work in this area, what are your hopes for leadership craft as a discipline within society and education over the next few years? Yeah, my, my hope is this idea of leadership of craft gets more broadly adopted. Um, and it's and, and I see it again. I mentioned that craft was something not spoken about. Craft actually kind of went out of fashion with the first industrial revolution. And as gradually industry kind of replaced crafts and got rid of crafts and turned them into, you know, assembly line processes. And craft became not such a, a big thing. But um, it, it, it's made a comeback as a whole thing. Craft overall has made a comeback. We live in a world dominated. The beer world is now dominated by craft beers, maybe not in volume, mm -hmm. but certainly in noise and how we talk about it and think about it. And particularly in New York. <laughs> but it, it's everywhere. Yeah, you know, where I live in, in Worcester, there's there's like four breweries, craft breweries within a five minute walk of my house. It's um, you know, it's it's incredible how much that how much that matters. And and it's craft has come back. I would like to see the the academic world and practice world really take on the idea of leadership as a craft, craft leadership, not necessarily leadership of craft, but the craft of being a leader, of leading. As, as being something, and we've seen a little movement toward that in the academic world. There's the leadership as practice movement, mm -hmm. which kind of starts to get there. And bless Joe Raylan's heart for all the work he's done in that. Is totally love love Joe's work and love Joe, great guy. But it it's to me, it's not far enough. <laughs> it's it hasn't pushed far. I want to push it all the way to. Let's be clear. Let's it's a craft. Let's approach it as a craft. Great, excellent. And um, if I could ask you to think for a second, uh, Steve, about your own successes in your own career, what are you most proud of when you look at your own successful work in the area of leadership and craft? Yeah, it's hard to say. It, it, I mean, it's, it's really hard to say what you've had most info. But the thing I think I'm, there's probably a recency bias in this, but I, I think I am particularly proud of the editorial I wrote last year, and I say editorial because I published it as an editorial in my journal, Organizational Aesthetics. Right. Only Connect, Confessions of a Reluctant Leader. And I feel like I'm I'm proud of that because I feel like I both grappled with um, some difficult ideas around what leadership craft is and what it means. And I, it was in, I also wrote it based upon my own experience of being interim dean of the business school for two and a half years, what that was like. Unlike most stories of leaders talking about their leadership, it's not a hero story. Mm. It's largely focused on my failures and shortcomings because I feel like I learn a lot more from those and they certainly hit home a lot more. Um, and I, I think that um, I, I am pleased with the, I, I think I'm proud of the honesty and depth of that in, in that work. I, I think um, right. you know that, that to me is, because that's what I what I want to do in scholarship. I want it to be both be personal, connected, and honest and deep. And let, right. that comes from again. That's probably because I have a my formative training was as a I had my bachelor's degree is in creative writing, and this was pounded into me as a writer. This is what you do. You know, you 
put it out there. You put yourself out there. You put your own, your deepest, most basic stuff. And you expose yourself to the world. And it may be somewhat masked if I'm like writing poetry or short stories, but it's got to be base. It's got to be grounded in that deep stuff of who you are. So I try to do that as an academic. And I think it's probably my most successful attempt to date at doing that as an academic. Right. And what, what's really fantastic, Steve, as well, hearing you speak about that and, and what you're most proud of are, are the very words and the ethos coming through that you've talked to us about in the last few minutes. You know, that care, that honesty uh, as well, that depth and really working at that body of work as well. So thank you. Thank you for that honesty uh, as well. And um, see, so coming to a, a close for listeners and viewers who want to develop their own approach to leadership, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I think the, um, the I think that the place to start for developing your own approach is to start a, is to gra- really come to terms with the question: Who do I want to be as a leader, and why is that difficult for me? Why, where, when is that difficult for me? And by that, I mean, let me give you a short example. Because I asked this question to my students, and I've kind of refined it over 20 years or so, but I asked my MBA students to answer this question and tell a little story about this. And so, for example, like one student who said, I want, I believe as a leader, you have to face conflict. You have to, you can't be conflict avoiding, you have to face it head on in a constructive way. And yet I have a great deal of difficulty doing that. And he traced it back. And he said, when I was, and he traces back to this moment. He goes, when I was three years old, I remember distinctly, my parents were fighting and I was caught in the middle, literally. My mom had my legs. My dad had my arms pulling in opposite direction. Wow. He mm. goes, I learned from that that conflict is bad and results in all mm-hmm. sorts of horrible things. And here he is, you know, in his 30s trying to overcome that still. But until he recognized where it came from and what it was about for him, he wasn't going to, he, he couldn't really do it. Mm. It was incredibly difficult. And, he, and it still is not easy, but it requires the sort of deep reflection of your own life story, both in terms of the values of what you think a good leader does. Like I have a, another, an, another student who talked about his idea of leadership. He goes, is about listening, about listening deeply, not listening to just what people say, but what's, what they mean and what's going on. And then he talked about why that is hard for him and, and how that, and plus times when that didn't happen in his life and what that did. So, so there's this, this kind of deep autobiographical exploration, I think is critical. And then recognizing where it's really hard for you to be the leader you want to be, and then experimenting, finding kind of safe places where it's hard, but not too hard. And you can take little steps. One of the ways we get better at things is by small incremental steps that we can build on. You know, we don't get better in huge, big leaps. We get better in small way after small incremental steps with small experiments and small work working on it in small pieces. And, and that's what we need to do. And, that, and that's not easy to do, but, but that is what we, we do. And I'll, I'll throw in a clutch. That's my, the book I'm currently revising, which hopefully will be out within the next year or so, will be Becoming the Leader You Want to Be. And right. all about analytic techniques for how to do that. Fantastic. And and thank you so much, because there's a real richness in the examples that you've shared and about finding out, you know, asking those retrospective questions and understanding where those blockages are coming from. So I think that would be hugely helpful to listeners and viewers today, Steve. So thank you for, for sharing that. And um, finally, as part of the ethos of the Society Health podcast series, we ask contributors to offer our listeners and viewers a free resource on today's topic. It would be great if you could say a few words, Steve, about the resource that you're making available to our listeners and viewers today, please. Yeah, well, I've already said a few words about it, but I'm I'm suggesting as a resource, a, a nice place to start is the the uh, editorial I wrote last year. And it's it's in um, the journal Organizational Aesthetics, which is open access. And you get www.organizationalaesthetics.org. And if you go back to the archive, you go back one year to 2022, You'll find a link to the uh, the editorial, which is called Only Connect, Confessions of a Reluctant Leader. And and admittedly, most of the editorials I've written for the journal are maybe like 1,500 words long. This one's 80,000 words. Um, It was originally meant to be a book project, but um, I didn't have any publishers who were interested in it. I took a quick round of various publishers, and they all said, this is really interesting. We don't want it. (laughs) (laughs) 
So you led in your own right. So I just said, I'm going to put it out there for free for everyone to have and read. And I encourage you to, to do that, to go online. Right. Thank you. And if you have questions, send me an email. Or if you have a Thank you. Incredibly generous, uh, Steve. Thank you very, very much. And we'll make the link available to the resource uh, uh, just below the video on our YouTube channel as well to make it easier for uh, listeners and viewers. Uh, Professor Steve Taylor, it has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you very much for being with us and for giving us a glimpse into the wonderful richness of your insight into leadership and craft. Thank you very much and wishing you every continued success in the future. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me.